All right. So first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. <clears throat> I'm Michael Lair, the Chief of Emergency Preparedness Response for the Department of Health. I've been with the Department of Health for about 18 months. Uh, right before the, uh, the mudslide in Snohomish County occurred last year, we'll talk more about that, uh, and seem, it seems like I've been responding ever since, um, just about nonstop. Uh, before that, I was with the, the Health Department in Seattle for about 12 years since the, the preparedness program started in this country, really, for public health, uh, a couple of years before it started for health care. Uh, before that, I was in Florida at the State Emergency Management Division for about six years. And so, you know, in thinking about this particular presentation and just sort of looking back at, at history, it's obviously been a very busy year. Uh, the fires are on everybody's mind, certainly, and as they should be. Um, last year was pretty busy, but I was thinking back all the way to 9-11 um, in, in this state how many times we've seen multiple healthcare systems, multiple healthcare sectors, multiple jurisdictions in the state of Washington impacted by a disaster, either, a, either a, a, an imminent or a potential disaster or a real threat, and in the past you know, 12 to 14 years. And it's just about once a year, right? It's just about every year, from measles outbreaks to H5N1 to H1N1, multiple firestorms, wind storms in, in western Washington, uh, you know, vaccine shortages, not to mention other types of medical supply shortages. This is a regular thing. This is a new normal. And so the question that comes to my mind isn't can we change this? Can we somehow get out of this? It, it's happening and it's going to continue to happen. The question really that I think about and that I, I pose to my staff is how are we adapting? How well is the Department of Health adapting to this new normal? And that's what I want to present to you today, is how we have changed dramatically over the last 18 months uh, and, uh, and where, we're go where we are going to, uh, to create more of a statewide response system. So we have not been in a position at the Department of Health to respond effectively to, to, to disasters forever. We really didn't have this capability two years ago. Um, we've been administering a, a preparedness program since 2002. Um, but and we got very good at administering grants. We got pretty good at administering contracts and completing deliverables and satisfying our funders and, and completing audits. Uh, all of these are, are very important. Um, but we did not develop extensive response capability. Now we have a very good state lab and, and they respond to, to infectious disease outbreaks. We have a very good radiological program and that's good to know when you've got a nuclear power plant in your state. It's good that, that these guys are on board. Um, and we have an epidemiology and surveillance program that supports local health departments. So those, those folks are pretty active and they respond to your, your, your normal public health issues, but we did not have any response capability to disasters. None. And the reason is, is that it was not our purpose, right? It was not the reason for the Department of Health when it comes to administering this program. We were grant managers, we were contract managers. And that, that doesn't really work, um, in my opinion. It, managing these, these administrative functions is, is important, but it's not our purpose. It's not why we're here. We have a, a new secretary came in in 2013, John Weitzman, and he, he made it very clear. He, he established a very clear vision, and that is we are going to become a response agency. And what that means is we are going to lead when necessary, we are going to support when it's appropriate, and we are always, always going to have a positive impact on the outcome of a disaster. And that starts by redefining our purpose. We, we started implementing that vision by redefining our purpose. And so our purpose, again, is nothing to do with our funders. It has nothing to do with grant requirements or, or audits. It has to do with saving lives. That's what our purpose is. That's why we show up to work. We are going to have a positive impact on the health and safety of people in Washington. And so that really changed our focus starting in February of 2014. And uh, then we had plenty of opportunity to, to, to learn starting uh, about four weeks later with the mudslide. 2014 really was a banner year. We had um, 130 plus days of incident activation at the state level in nine months. So we were always responding to something. Uh, the mudslide, of course, in Snohomish County, multiple measles outbreaks, 
the firestorm, uh, Ebola, and we had a multi-day full-scale exercise on top of that. And that level of activity taught us a couple things. One is we realized that we have to become that response agency very quickly. This is not a five-year program. This is not a gradual glide path. This is an exponential curve. And we need to be focused entirely on developing that capability. The second thing we learned is that we have to be able to do multiple things concurrently. You don't have a response plan or a response capability, no matter what your organization is, whether you're an agency or a hospital or, or a company or anything else, unless you have a good continuity of operations plan first. Because when you respond, you're taking people from one side of the house and moving into the other. Are you still taking care of your most important day-to-day -day business? And if you're not, then you're just creating another disaster you know, right behind you. So we learned very quickly that we have to have good continuity of operations. We have to be able to support people in need. When, when local health departments or tribes or healthcare systems call us for help, we have to be of value to them. We're not just advising the governor on this, that, or the other. We have to actually have an impact on someone else's response. And third, we realize that we have to be able to lead when necessary. That is probably the biggest change from, from the past is the state Department of Health, specific, specifically the Secretary of Health, making decisions when necessary. It doesn't happen all the time. It should be pretty rare. But when there are circumstances, either challenges or opportunities that require uh, central coordination and decision making, when there is a statewide incident like H1N1, when there's a situation where resources may need to be rationed, when there's a situation where consistency is necessary across the state. I'll give you an example with Ebola. Um, CDC came out with a lot of recommendations regarding how to address um, healthcare workers coming back from Western Africa regarding their level of exposure to Ebola, right? There was high risk individuals, moderate risk, low risk, no risk, and they went, kind of went through some iterations over time. And there were recommendations about what level of monitoring was suggested by CDC given these different levels of risk. Well, what approach should we take? That was just recommendations. CDC doesn't direct anyone to do anything. So what level of, of monitoring should occur in Washington State for someone who is, say, high risk, which means they've been exposed to bodily fluids from a confirmed Ebola patient while they were in, in West Africa. They're still within a 21-day period. Now, there's authority at the local level to compel quarantine, to compel isolation. That authority also rests at the state level. But we have 35 different health districts, health departments, health jurisdictions. There could be 35 different ways of doing business. Is that OK? Are, under this circumstance, when someone is, say, high risk, is that, is that an appropriate level? In some jurisdictions, they're doing direct active monitoring. In some jurisdictions, they're just doing monitoring via the phone. In some jurisdictions, they're ordering people into quarantine. In other jurisdictions, they're just suggesting. Is, is that a situation where statewide consistency is appropriate? And the secretary said, yeah, it is. They will be quarantined. They will be requested. And if they don't comply, they will be directed into quarantine via a court order. And that's going to happen everywhere. doesn't mean the state's going to do it. A local can do it. But if, if there's a need to step in, we will establish consistency across the state. And that's a rare example. But it is an example where there are times we have to be capable of leading at the state level. And 2015 just seems to be more of the same. I mean, it's almost like Armageddon, Apocalypse, and whatever else you want to throw onto it. Um, number of opportunities. Again, the measles outbreak here in Spokane, uh, this was a great opportunity for us to implement a new capability that we created at the state level just within the last year and a half. This is another change where when we see an opportunity to build something that can benefit everyone in the state concurrently, why leave it to, to local jurisdictions to try to figure it out and fund themselves? So we partnered with the Washington Poison Center um, to expand a capability that they had developed uh, on, on the west side to establish a statewide all-hazard public health call center and nurse triage line. And this measles outbreak was a perfect opportunity to test that. Small event, we wanted to, to activate this line so that we take pressure off of health departments and we take pressure off of emergency departments to provide people with health information that, uh, that helps them make, make better decisions. Um, and so we learned a lot, but it was, it was a great opportunity for us to, to put in place something that is um, 
is going to be very use, useful in something like a pandemic or even something like a school shooting. Um, avian flu was a was a, an ongoing issue for us in a number of jurisdictions. Also highlighted a new capability for us. We were in a position where folks who were exposed to these birds who ended up having to be destroyed required prophylaxis, antiviral prophylaxis, and they required that very, very quickly. And if they're up in Whatcom County or in some other rural part of the state, they don't necessarily have access to those medications very quickly. So we mobilized medications from the Department of Health stockpile directly to those local health jurisdictions to provide that prophylaxis to the people and their families. And that got us thinking, well, why can't we do this anywhere in Washington during a seasonal flu outbreak, particularly in something like a nursing home, where the nursing home can get access to antivirals, but not enough to prophylax the facility. And assuming that's a, that's a wise public health move and the local health officer is supportive of that, can the Department of Health loan antivirals to that facility to start prophylaxis? And when those meds come in, we get reimbursed with the medication. So it's, uh, it's not a gift of public resources. It's, a, it's basically helping stamp out a, a disease outbreak quickly by partnering between local health, state health, and the facility itself. So that was another sort of change to the Department of Health going from being just sort of a, an administrative body to being a direct responder. And then, of course, the fires. I mean, you, you guys obviously know more about this locally than, than I do. But just to give you an idea of, of what our response entailed, we moved 100,000 N95 respirators to four counties and two tribes. We procured 15 HEPA filter air purifiers. Before the event, we had zero. We now have 15 uh, and deployed them to multiple counties and tribes. We deployed a liaison to support the, the Colville tribe and was there for, I think, about 18 days, rotated three people through that position. And we delivered with, in partnership with a number of folks, albuterol, nebulizers, and, and epinephrine. And that was that delivery of medication was critical. It partnered State Department of Health, Spokane uh, Health, uh, Providence Sacred Heart, Providence St. Pete, the Washington State Patrol, and the Washington State Pharmacy Association, all together to make that mission happen, to deliver key medications to a place that they were absolutely needed. And I highlight all that because, again, two years ago, none of that was even possible. And it's not just that we were totally uh, incapable of doing it, as we were, it wasn't what we were about. It wasn't our mission. It wasn't our purpose. And so, you know, we are, obviously, we are driving to change that. Uh, we need to, we need, we need to really change our entire focus. We need to focus on establishing core capability everywhere. We need to establish advanced capability where it's appropriate. We need to make sure we have the logistical systems in place to move anything, anywhere, anytime. And we need to have the partnerships in place to make all of that happen. That's, in summation, that's the entire public health and, and healthcare preparedness program for the state of Washington. That's what we need to be able to do. There's a lot of little pieces that come off of that, but that's really where we're going. So some key lessons learned. Um, I just want to drill down on these four. Um, because again, I've been doing this for about 20 years, and, and this really sort of hit home for me in 2014, 2015, to turn the state program around uh, as, as a Department of Health and to support the statewide effort at the same time. Um, you know, it requires an awful lot of sort of rustling of feathers, and, and everyone's got an agenda, and everyone wants to do something different. But these are sort of the four things that really stood out for me that, that have been keys to our success. The first is, is just investing the people. Um, we did a lot of uh, adjusting of our budget uh, and our priorities. And the one thing that we not only did we not cut, but we increased in, in a, a time of a dramatic budget reduction in the last two years was training and, and investing people. We haven't cut a single position. We actually increased money to local health departments and healthcare coalitions. We haven't increased money to the Department of Health. We've maintained our, our own level budget. We just use our money much differently. And we've maintained a level staffing, but we are harnessing the expertise and the skills of that staff, putting them through some incredibly valuable training. And that is what has paid off. All the widgets you want to buy, all the contractors you want to hire, you know, may provide some incremental benefit. But the people who are around you in an activated ERC and the other people on the other end of the phone, that's what's going to make the difference. That's what I've learned no matter where I've been. It's always been people solving problems, working with, with each other. 
Secondly, we focused on the basics. We had no capability. We had no plan. We had no real, no EOC to, to, to turn to for the Department of Health. We had to start from the ground up. We didn't start with the most complex things. We didn't start building alternate care facilities or, or developing quarantine facilities. We started with how do you activate in a, a response structure? How do you even share information within your department? Pretty basic stuff. How do you make a decision if you're the secretary? What information do you need from your team to make an appropriate decision? Now this sounds like, you know, God, we should have had this in place a long time ago, and we should have. But it doesn't take long, and it doesn't take a lot of money. But if you don't have the basics down, forget about planning for anything more advanced. 90% of what you do in every disaster is the same for every disaster. You'll run into some weirdness, like with Ebola and the whole quarantine piece. That's unusual, and that's going to come up, and you can muddle your way through that. But you can't muddle your way through gathering intel from core healthcare facilities around your region as to whether they're okay and they're not okay. That is a basic action that needs to happen in every disaster, and that is not something you can figure out at the time. So we really focused our team on the very basics at the state level. What are the things we always are going to do when we activate during an emergency? And that's what we really trained our people on. Third, it's really about um, recognizing we can't do it ourselves. You know, we got to share the load. Um, I come from the East Coast where mutual aid is like breathing air. I mean, it's just normal. Here, I just get a sense in, in the Northwest that there's this independent streak, this independent nature. And I know in Region 9, it's, you've got good mutual aid agreements in place. We have to, particularly from a healthcare perspective, we have to be okay with asking for help and asking early for help. Don't wait until it's too late, because then, in fact, it is too late. You know, learn how to ask for help early and be willing to share that help and, and make sure we have the agreements in place that expedite help. A mutual aid agreement is not a requirement by any stretch, but it does pave the way. It gets rid of the legal questions. It gets rid of the administrative and the financial questions so that providing help becomes a much more effective and much more efficient process. And finally, you know, for me, a lot of what I do is, is about innovation. Um, I think we need the ability to see around corners. We've got to be able to anticipate. Um, we've got to be able to make decisions today that put us in a position to respond more effectively tomorrow. It's not just about reacting more quickly to an event. It's about learning to be proactive and in a way that that requires taking some degree of risk. To give you an example, um, you know, last year in the fires we went through uh, an extensive experience and at the Department of Health we sat down and said, well, what are the most likely resources that we're going to be asked for in the next fire season? And it came down to staff, respirators, and beds. Those three things. Now, after this event, it's like, well, let's throw, you know, air filters on there and, and let's throw regulatory waivers and some, some other things, so we're going to expand that, but staff, respirators, and beds. And so we worked throughout the year to train staff from multiple regions across the state and have them ready to respond with us in the field if we needed to. Thank you, Susan, for your folks volunteering to be part of an incident management team. We stored respirators on the east side and on the west side. We've got 26,000 still in Spokane, and we stored medical beds on the east side and on the west side. So that if we needed to move quickly, we had the resources where they needed to be, not just stuck in Olympia, and we have the transportation contracts in place to have any resource on the ground anywhere in the state within two hours. That's what we did over the winter to be prepared for this, for this fire season. And that's what I'll encourage all of you to do is think about what are those things we might be asked for, we might have to do, and start planning for them now. So shifting gears from response a bit to preparedness, we, how we prepare has changed quite a bit as well. Uh, in 2014, a lot of it was a bit of a scramble, particularly around healthcare preparedness. We got a cut, I'm sure you all know, 40% in, in one year. We had about 60 days notice to readjust our entire healthcare preparedness program around a 40% reduction in, in funding. And we were able to do that by, again, focusing back on our purpose, which is to save lives, and it is to ensure we can have a positive impact on response. And quite frankly, I just didn't believe that equipment was the way to do that. So we sliced our entire statewide equipment budget and uh, cut a couple of other contracts that just weren't of value, weren't productive. And at the same time, we doubled our training budget for healthcare staff. 
and we increase planning resources to healthcare coalition. And uh, so I think that was a, it was a good outcome. We kept what I think is, is the most important asset, our people, in place. One thing we did not do, and it was just too much change to happen at, at once, we did not change our purpose as a healthcare preparedness program. We did not change the purpose of coalition. So coalitions received the funding, and they're free to pretty much do whatever they wanted to do within some boundaries that, they, that our funder prescribes, but they're not real tight. Coalitions, and there's eight coalitions across the state, they're free to do whatever, they were free to do whatever they wanted to do. And imagine just how inconsistent our level of healthcare preparedness and response had been across the state with that. And it's not to blame anybody, it's natural. You know, you're gonna, you're gonna take on whatever you think is a priority and, and move forward in that, in that regard. And there really was no focus almost anywhere in the state on response, on healthcare response. Who does the responding? Who focuses on supporting healthcare during a disaster? So in 2015, our, our focus on preparedness and how we prepare from a healthcare perspective is changing dramatically. And this, this is starting July 1 of this year. Um, we have a number of key priorities. Uh, and first and foremost is everything we do has got to support response and recovery. We have to be response oriented. When there's a healthcare facility or system or region in jeopardy, we all have to lean forward, and we all have a responsibility to support that. It's, I'm not just helping, you know, private interdeaconess or Harborview or anybody else become prepared as a facility or as a system. That's not even my job. That's not my role. It's not my purpose. It's not yours either in, in local health departments. Our, our purpose, again, is to save lives, and our job really is to ensure that the entire system is resilient and is able to respond and recover and continue to do what it needs to do. And so there's, there's inherent integration across multiple sectors. So again, we're, we're improving response, we're standardizing our work. The contract activities for coalitions across the state are identical, absolutely identical. We took control away from, from healthcare coalitions, although got their input on, on activities and the state decided here are the 10 to 12 activities we want every coalition to perform. Now you can go well beyond that if you want to. If, if you've got these things done, by all means, let's talk about what else you want to do. But everybody's going to be capable and, and proficient in these core 10 to 12 activities. Obviously, I mentioned before, we're going to ensure rapid surge support anywhere in the state of Washington. So this is going to follow on later in the presentation, but what role do, do regions play in this? What role do systems play in this? And what role should the state play in ensuring a logistics capability where we can move things, people and stuff, and patients, quite frankly, anywhere we need to? Partnerships are really a, a critical component of this, the, the whole community piece. I mentioned our work with the Poison Center. We're doing a lot of work with pharmacy chains on them stepping up and, and being more of a leader, more of a responder during during incidents, we have to continue that as well. Uh, statewide mutual aid, we have this in place for uh, local health departments. We are working on it now with medical examiners and coroners to have a statewide mutual aid capability. What about hospitals and health systems? Regions have it in place, but is it, is it appropriate and necessary and wise to have a statewide mutual aid capability? It doesn't require anybody to do anything, but it allows folks and enables folks to share resources much more effectively across the entire state. One thing we're doing for the first time, I'm a little embarrassed to admit this, uh, but for the first time ever, we're actually measuring our progress. We're tracking what we're doing. We're tracking whether or not we're making progress towards a goal. And this hasn't been done at the national level either. Uh, with one exception, there's only one program that we've ever been uh, required to track our progress and measure progress, and that's been the medical countermeasures program, the mass dispensing, mass vaccination, but otherwise public health and healthcare preparedness, we've never tracked progress. So this is not a federal requirement, this is something we're, we're doing at the state level in partnership with the eight coalitions to make sure that we are making progress, that we are showing value to the people that we serve. And overall, we're really investing, we consider the grant to be an investment in a statewide response team. We're not really interested in, at the state level, in developing facility-based capability or or capability that helps one agency or even just one county. We want to make sure we have the broadest reach and the broadest impact with our program. So that leads me to sort of the next question, and that is um, 
how should we prepare for the next healthcare disaster? I mentioned, you know, we have we have our coalition structure, you know, we have eight different healthcare coalitions across the state. They're designed based on government boundaries, and these have been in place forever um, since the beginning of the program. Um, and seven of the eight healthcare coalitions are health departments, the largest health departments pretty much in the state, and the one in the Seattle Tacoma area is led by a nonprofit. But it's pretty much not healthcare based at all. It's government based. It's a government based program. It's government funded, government structured, government facilitated, government administrated. So I guess the question I've got is with healthcare changing so dramatically just in the last few years, who knows where it's going to be in a couple of years, right? Who, who would have guessed, you know, we'd be here five years ago? And our health, but our healthcare preparedness structure has not changed in 10 years. Does that, does that really make a lot of sense? Rarely even do we ask healthcare executives, what are the most important disaster preparedness issues that you're concerned about for your system? You know, not so much for one hospital, for, for the system that you work in, what do you feel are the most important issues? I feel that we've been tied so much to a government-led process. And that doesn't mean government has been ordering anybody around. It just means that we've taken it all on and we've been responsible for it. So we come at it with a government lens, a government focus. And this isn't about government at all. This is about ensuring that our integrated healthcare system, our healthcare network, is resilient, is able to respond effectively and to rely on each other during a disaster. So we've changed the way we've utilized resources, we've changed the activities that we have been focusing on, but we haven't done anything to change that map, to change the structure. And I'm not coming in to here with a lot of answers, I'm coming in with a lot more questions. And mainly the questions that, the questions that I have are these. One is how do you reconcile, how do you reconcile the needs of multi regional health systems, integrated health systems with individual health care facilities. An individual skilled nursing facility is a critical, critical facility in that county. And then Providence, which is all over the place, group health, which is all over the place, they're, they're both part of a, of a local health care network, a health care system. There are interdependencies. There are, there are impacts that one can have on the other in the disaster. How do you reconcile their preparedness needs? They, they probably don't prepare the same way, right? Providence or Group Health, they touch six or seven coalitions who may do things six or seven different ways. Does it really make sense to carve resources out region by region, government region by government region, and expect coalitions to just figure it out? Is that, is that the best way we should be structured? Secondly, Ebola kind of taught us this, how prepared do we need to become? I don't worry too much about, about federal requirements. There really aren't many other than managing the resources appropriately, but they don't tell us like they used to. You will have X number of burn beds per 100,000 people. That, that, those days are gone. They pretty much let us figure out what our priorities are and how we're going to achieve them, which I think is a good thing. But how prepared do we need to become? You know, Ebola put it front and center with us. How prepared does Deaconess or Sacred Heart or Harborview need to become compared to a 25-bed critical access hospital. Clearly, they should not meet the same levels of preparedness. But what's consistent across those two facilities? What about facilities in between? A 100-bed hospital that's got a lot more activity. How prepared does that facility need to become for the next Ebola or MERS or flu or something else that comes in? How do we define that level of capability? And how do we make sure it's consistent across the state? And third, are there certain capabilities that should be centralized, certain healthcare response capabilities or preparedness actions that should be centralized, that should be done centrally by one coalition and shared with everyone or by the state? Should we duplicate things eight times and try to do things with the limited resources we have, or should we concentrate certain things? In other words, should we narrow our focus of work that coalitions, and we, we talked about this at lunch, that coalitions address not to try to pull in everyone in the healthcare community and not to try to work on every aspect that seems important to everyone, but really narrow it down. At the state level, we focus on hospitals with emergency departments, which leaves out some, hospitals with emergency departments, skilled nursing facilities, dialysis centers, and blood banks. Those four, we feel, are of such critical importance in every community 
that we have to be leaning forward on the issues that may affect their functionality, the needs they may have to stay operational. Doesn't mean other people are unimportant, other facilities are not important, or may not have an effect on the disaster or have something to contribute during the disaster. It just means we spread ourselves so thin we can't be effective anywhere. So does that resonate at the regional level as well? What about the types of issues we should be focusing on? Should we focus on all, all eight capabilities that are within the ASPR guidance and you know everything from recovery to behavioral health to fatality management and everything in between? Or should we narrow our focus down and say there are a couple of core things that we've got to get done and we've got to, we've got to remain, we've got to sustain for the long term? And with the limited resources we have, maybe we focus on operational readiness. We have a response system in place that we know we can turn on anytime, anywhere. We're drilled, we're trained, we're ready to go. And then we shift gears towards statewide initiatives, statewide capabilities, things like multi-regional patient transport. Right? Who, who can do that on their own? What region can do that on their own? You know, is that something where we have a statewide focus and a statewide emphasis? So it's, it's this tug of war that I think we have uh, between the past and the present and between sort of local and, and much more broad system-based how do, we, how do we undo the government structure we put in place? Because as you can tell, I feel it's inevitable. The way healthcare is evolving, it just doesn't recognize the preparedness boundaries we've artificially established. And recognize that we will always have a response role that government is going to be uh, in, in place to, to achieve. Government has to have a role with that, to support healthcare facilities, to support healthcare operations during any disaster. But that's, that's not going to gobble up all the money. That's going to be a, 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 a standard function of government forever. It's written into our Constitution in the preamble. Um, but to me, when it comes to broader preparedness, we need to, we need to meet healthcare where they are, which is not tied to a government boundary. It's, it's a systems approach as well as recognizing the needs of individual facilities. So we have to, we have to balance those two needs, and I think we need to we need to start those discussions and we need to actively engage in those discussions throughout the year. There's not going to be an easy answer and there's certainly not going to be a one-size-fits-all. But I think we can do things much more efficiently uh, than we have over the past 10 years. And just knowing that we haven't changed in 10 years when healthcare is unrecognizable tells me that we're out of step. Um, and I think we've, we've taken a huge step forward in focusing more on response uh, in this current year. Uh, and I think that that demonstrated itself in the wildfires, but we need to, I think we need to keep, keep working forward. So just in quick summary, um, I think our vulnerability is just increasing. We are reliant on technology. We are absolutely reliant on uh, a just-in-time supply chain, uh, both of which are highly vulnerable. Our, our threat environment is just increasing, and it's not just climate change. It's, there's a lot of different elements involved. In that and so we need to again recognize that this is absolutely normal. So when it comes to you know asking that question, are healthcare executives at the table? Right? Do they think it's important? If they don't now, they certainly will. They certainly will. When 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 business is threatened and it will be threatened, um, you know th this is going to become a much more critical issue. And so I think it's important to be, be up front now, be in the door now, uh, working with partners. Uh, certainly don't be afraid to, to, you know, call out the elephant in the room, as, as I've, I've tried to do. And that is, just because we've done it before does not mean it's okay now. It, and we could even say it was great to start that way. I mean, I'll say that. I'll say that's a great way to start, but we are well down the road in healthcare preparedness, in, in response. We've learned a lot from response. We've got a lot fewer requirements at the federal level, so we have a lot more freedom to do what we need to do. Challenge the status quo. Throw out ideas that are somewhat off the wall and vigorously debate them because we should be organized as effectively and efficiently as possible given that resources are, are narrowing. And expect results, certainly. The public demands it, um, and I think the public deserves results from us. We've been doing this for 12 years now, it's $190 million or so that's come into the state of Washington during that time. It's a lot of money, and we should be very proficient in the, at least the basics for all hazards disaster response. Um, 
So I, I appreciate the opportunity to work with all of you, uh, certainly with you know with Bill Joseph and the, the Colville Tribe and, and Susan and her folks and, and Travis uh, at Spokane Regional Health District. It's, it's been great in working with Sacred Heart uh, and Deaconess on a variety of projects. Um, it's been fantastic working in Region 9. You guys are, are at the top of the game, in my opinion, in the state of Washington. And I, uh, I, I value work, uh, these relationships, and I value continuing uh, that work with all of you. So with that, I am done, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Hi, I just had a couple questions on, uh, it sounds like the efforts which are laudable, but are focused on intrastate. Is there any thought about interstate? Um, reciprocity of licensure, professional licensure, uh, the logistics of it, both in receiving assistance and providing assistance across state lines. Excellent question about reciprocity and, and interstate coordination. So there's a couple of areas where we have engaged on that and we continue to, and then there's a couple of major challenges that we have. So there is an agreement across all 50 states and all the territories in the United States called the Emergency Management Assistance Compact. Basically, it's just a mutual aid agreement for states. And so we can share resources with other states that are government resources. They also include volunteers. But I cannot share a paid physician or nurse from Oregon with Washington that works in the private sector under that agreement. So that's off the table. So I have some, some ability to do that and to coordinate and plan. Uh, similarly, we have an agreement with Oregon and, and multiple, uh, and Idaho and multiple Canadian provinces, same kind of thing. It's a mutual aid agreement where we can share certain resources across, across lines. The, the, the idea of licensure across multiple states we have not fixed, with the exception of volunteers. If I have a registered volunteer, they can come from anywhere. They can come from another country. And I can bring them into Washington. They can be a doctor, nurse, pharmacist, or nothing. They don't even have to be licensed. And I can put them in a medical facility, uh, most likely a, you know, a, a, like a gymnasium or something of that nature. And they can, they can provide medical care. As long as they're not engaging in gross negligence, that is perfectly acceptable. They're volunteers, though. I can't pay them. So we have a lot of these if-thans and these, these, these sort of hoops that we have to jump through. Suffice it to say, it is not at all easy to move healthcare personnel around this country at all if you're going to pay them. It is not easy at all. So I would actually be, if we were talking about this earlier today, I would, I would look to these multi-state systems and say, how do you move people around? Do you move people across your system across state lines? And if you do, do you simply credential them in both states? Do you license them in both states? Because that would be very helpful for us to know. You know, do you take care, essentially take care of your own, and how do you do that? Um, I don't know if there's an easy fix to that, but at a minimum, I think we need to start learning more about what happens on a daily basis and, and how can we start affecting, uh, affecting that during a disaster. Hey, Michael. Uh, thanks for the challenge. I appreciate uh, kind of your leadership there and some of the ideas you planted. Um, so I am, uh, as of four days ago, started with Providence Healthcare in Spokane. The last 11 years I've been working um, in Spokane and as the Region 9 coordinator supporting the 10 counties and three tribes. One thing I, I would ask from a Department of Health perspective is uh, please continue to work with Emergency Management Division. Um, through the years, uh, you know, there, there's always this, a little bit of us and them at whatever discipline you're with. but. I think it's critical that Department of Health works closely with the Emergency Management Division. Um, so I would ask that you please uh, continue that. Uh, it sounds like some of the direction you're going could have a very positive effect on Emergency Management Division, um, something which I, I was frustrated with for the, a number of years. But uh, also, don't, don't overlook the, the smallest jurisdictions. I heard what you were saying, I think, about uh, you know we may not focus on every hospital but you know, spending uh, some time in Republic a few weeks ago with wildfires, um, it's very tough if the hospitals and the state is not supporting the locals um, and really pushing that con uh, relationship with emergency management um, when they have to work together. And up there they had to, and, and there was a lot of local issues. But please 
keep a focus there. The one other thing I would ask is uh, on a capabilities-based focus, which I appreciate. Um, I've, uh, I've tried to champion this for years, but if we could get our federal partners to one set of capabilities, uh, that would be wonderful. Um, and I think it would solve some of the differences that we've seen between the Department of Health and Emergency Management Division. It would, it would get us in step. So I know that's been being worked from your predecessors and Emergency Management Division, but if that's a worthy cause, please keep that one going. Um, and I had a question, but I think it's kind of uh, escaped me. Um, oh, I, I'm, I'm interested in learning more about the metrics that you talked about, because that is something that's been elusive for us. And so, uh, very curious, I think you said that's a, a July work plan going forward, is that right? Yeah, starting July 1 of the current year, so back a couple of months ago, for health departments and all health departments and for all health care coalitions, we are going to be measuring progress towards those activities, mainly towards the core activities, not necessarily everything, but the ones that are of greatest value, the ones that, have the, that tell the greatest story, right? So for the Department of Health, we have our own metrics. We have 14 different metrics that we're tracking that really are indicators of broader issues, right? So you know, there's a, there's a key component like the, the uh, number of pharmacies signed on to the statewide pharmacy agreement and particularly the percentage of, of people in the state of Washington that live within five miles of a pharmacy that is signed on to the agreement. And what that tells me is not just, well, we have a lot of pharmacies on a map. What that tells me is, do we really embody a whole community approach? Do we, do we walk the walk now? Do we have enough pharmacies to actually tilt you know, the playing field towards encompassing a broader use of community resources? If that number is down, it's a government-centric response. If that number is way up, now we've got key players to the table. So we have, we have 14 metrics for ourselves that are all geared in that direction. What does it really tell beyond just the numbers? And we're going to be working with public health and with coalitions on those activities and pulling out the ones that tell the biggest story. So it's not necessarily everything, but what are the five or six or so that we, we want to track statewide? And then we want to share that information statewide. And we want to see where are we doing well and are we consistently falling behind in certain areas? What's the problem there? What is, what is it that we need? Is it more money? Is it different direction? What is the issue? So. Thank you.